Would you recommend it to someone who can afford it? <laughs> oh, 100%. It's an absolutely unique experience. Just it changes uh, a lot of ways you think about it. And it is it is the biggest roller coaster in the world. Okay, so it's the second biggest because we have Virgin Galactic. But it is like a roller coaster that goes through 15,000 feet in elevation changes in a minute. It is amazing. In less than a month, I'm going to be able to feel what it's like to be weightless, which is probably the closest that I'll get to being an astronaut, at least for now. I want a zero G contest sponsored by Moondow last year. One of the comments that I get a lot on my channel is, wow, we really wish that we could actually see Ellie reporting from space. So I know that going on this zero G experience will be one step closer. And I would love to share that with everyone at home. So I really hope I'm considered for this opportunity. I promise it won't go to waste. Many of you voted for me to go on this zero G experience so I can share what it's like with you at home. 100%, it's an absolutely unique experience. Now, before we get into the interview with Scott, I just want to re-emphasize that we still have room on the flight. You can join me for this zero G flight. This will be Friday, February 23rd, and we're flying out of Orlando, flying out of Kennedy Space Center. Not only will you join me on the flight, but you'll also be joined by Moonwalker Charlie Duke, as well as astronauts Doug Hurley and Nicole Stott. So yeah, this is a pretty legendary lineup, and I'm hoping that more of you guys can join us on the flight. We do still have a few seats left. So if this is something that you're interested in, I have the contact emails in the description of this video, also pinned in the comments with who you need to reach out for for those details. So make sure to mention my discount code Ellie to either Pablo or Christina when you reach out to them. That'll save you $1,000 on your ticket. Now, I know a couple people who have flown zero G, but I wanted to talk to someone we know and love so that he could also help explain to you what it's gonna be like and give me some tips. That's right, Scott Manley was able to fly zero G not too long ago. He says he would have done a couple things differently. And so you flew out of where? Oakland. Uh, I do wear the shirt around and I'm always around like pilot people. And they're the ones that see that and they're like, oh, I really want to do that. How much is it? Eight thousand dollars. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe. And it's not a no, it's not a hard no, because you know, like I'm, I'm paying you know three hundred fifty dollars an hour for my for the service rental, so it's not that ridiculous. And here's some advice that he had for me. Number one, you said that people didn't really get sick on your flight. That's what I'm most afraid of. How did you feel? Well, I I was totally. Uh, first of all, I took you know Dramamine or whatever the the thing is, right? That's the motion sickness thing. And I went in with just a little bit of food and I just sort of, you know, put my mind state in like, okay, let's keep, keep a level head here. Avoid like turning your head too quickly when it's doing rotations and stuff because you got to understand the whole plane is moving around you. But um, yeah, they think that laying down works. Um, and frankly, I that's what most people did. And I chose to sit up for most of mine. After the first one, it's like, I can do this. Yeah. Um, and that worked fine for me. But yeah, I mean, like if you feel anything, the first thing to do is sort of slow down and stop stop rotating your head. I suggest going to like a theme park or whatever and trying one of those big spinny things. And, uh, you know, just do that. Yeah, seriously, do that. Go on roller coasters, right? Get yourself like uh, a bit of practice in. I know it's the winter, but this is the kind of, uh, you know, weird motions that you're going to get. Jump in a swimming pool and like just do somersaults underwater, right? Yeah. All that stuff is kind of just good at getting your motion sickness thing going on. Because I, I do this a lot now in the plane. I'm like, okay, let's do a 60 degree steep turn. And you know, you can feel like some people in the right seats, they'll be like, whoa, okay, stop this. This is too much. Yeah. I'm like, this is normal now, right? Build up your tolerance beforehand is what I'm saying. Well, I think you, it's like when you're in the car and you read something on your phone or try to read a book. Absolutely. Exactly the same thing. And so, you know, if you practice all this, then you get used to it. You know, you know, also just try some like VR stuff where the where you're like sitting down and it's moving all around you or whatever. This is a funny thing, you know, I used to just I did somersaults across the bed as well to like just really kick in like weird <laughs> responses to motion sickness. And the hardest part, actually, the part that makes most people sick is during the, the hyper G moment. 
Yes. Right? And that's so you're pulling like 1.8 G's and people move their heads around and they get sick. Don't be looking at your phone. Like, don't be getting on Twitter when you're doing this. No. <laughs> So yeah. here we are going into the plane. We don't have yes. a whole thing, but um, it's so just... it's a seven twenty seven, right? Yes, yes. So it's extraordinarily cool. You can board this by via the stair in the rear, and you'll notice there's not very many seats. This is where yeah. you get sent if you're motion sick. There you are. <laughs> yeah. So you see me with the the G loading app. That's gauges, so you oh, can okay. have it floating around in zero G if you like. So would now that you've had you know perspective you, you some time has passed and you're also a pilot now do you think about it any differently or would you have done anything differently uh, i would have spent a lot less time trying to do some of the experiments that i did i would have brought a camera like i've got a more modern gopro what i brought was an old school gopro which didn't have motion stabilization and everything ended up blurry did, so, did i just see you do a, a one-handed push-up is that something that i should try oh that was so that was like they do early on they do like moon gravity and or mars gravity first and then moon gravity and so i was like one of the first things I was like great i'm gonna do one arm push-ups uh because there was a thing like a train like a martian meme that went around a few years ago and i was like doing one arm push-ups mar arm gravity which you know but i think i was a bit younger when <laughs> i'm not yeah. sure i can do those anymore oh in, my gosh our... mr manly being manly right yeah <laughs> now private companies like zero g have actually really helped nasa well, and from watching your video, it sounds like the NASA Office of Low Gravity was officially out by, what, 2014? It was done and switched over to private zero-G. Yeah, it was one of the things that the NASA felt could be privatized and that there was potentially a market there. And it did sort of make sense because clearly there's a lot of tourism in interest and there's government you know experiment interest and stuff and if you know if you can do that on the same aircraft that's great so like let's talk a little bit about the history and why this is more than just you know something for really rich people to splurge on well here's the thing you need to generate microgravity conditions for all sorts of science experiments before they go into space it changes a lot of things and this is an important technical thing to get the most the longest chunks of microgravity that are possible without actually flying to space right. you get about 20 25 seconds depending upon what you're trying to do and you know you're gonna get good engineering data that you can't get any other way but yeah you're also floating around in space and people love that that so this is why these things exist you know one example i can think of where the microgravity was really essential to the mission was osiris rex right because they had to perform a sample acquisition in zero gravity and in a vacuum now obviously they couldn't emulate both of those things simultaneously they can actually depressurize some of their scientific uh you know enclosures uh to like external pressures but um yeah so they they used that to verify that the sample collection head would probably work in low gravity but i've seen other ones where they test like a sample collection drills for asteroids in zero gravity i've seen things wow. like fluid you're making sure that some uh fluid experiment that's going to be in the space station will actually operate correctly so wow. very important that this stuff gets tested before you actually send it all the way to space yeah definitely wow at the time that you did the flight you were not a pilot yet correct i was not a pilot but i was on my way i was only a few months really into that thing but i was like super focused on this plane so what do you think it would be like now that you have pilot experience to actually be flying the zero g plane Oh, to actually, well, I mean, I tried it in like, you know, like home flights and it's just really, it's, it's, there's a lot of coordination, a lot of skill involved to actually hit this very narrow corridor. So here's something really fascinating to think about, right? The aircraft is what, you know, like 20 feet wide or something, right? You want, it wants to fly so that you remain inside this like corridor so you don't bump at the top of the, or the bottom. And it's just like lane holding right it's like holding a lane in your car and the lane is the same width as the plane right so imagine now that you're having to do lane holding with that precision while traveling at 500 miles an hour <laughs> right so it's a little... but they have the tools they have the little rubber ducky they have the g meter 
And there's another thing where they actually have to hold the correct speed. So look, this is something you train up to, and simply, you know, it's a 727, it needs a crew of three. They actually have an engineer in there as well. So I don't think that I'm in any position to be able to fly with that level of precision without hundreds of hours of practice. But boy, would I love to learn that. Now, how safe, you know, for someone who maybe wants to do this, um, how safe are these flights? Uh, well, they haven't crashed one. <laughs> No, I mean, look, this is an airliner and it has to fly according. This is, I, I mean, this is actually legally an airliner. So you yeah. actually have to go through airport security and they'll actually have a special check-in for you with airport like check-in metal detector and stuff. Right. Like this is what it legally has to be. You know, the cockpit door will be locked so that because it's an airliner, right? Right. But they're flying it very differently than just your normal flight. Yes, and so, but they're not moving outside the G-loading that's allowed, uh, that's, you know, anticipated uh, for the airframe. They have specially modified uh, hydraulic systems, I believe. So I think it's the hydraulic system that they modified so that handles, like, low gravity. Because there's a lot of things in a plane which rely on fluids flowing and having positive gravity. Right. And, like, engines with fuel and oil and hydraulics. Yeah. So all those systems need to be modified so that they can actually handle sustained, you know, zero gravity or microgravity conditions. Right. Uh, and so they had to document all this as well so that the FAA would let them do this kind of uh, you know, flight. NASA, on the other hand, by the way, they were a government organization. They didn't have to satisfy FAA rules. So oh, you know, wow. they sort of just did their own thing and they occasionally had issues and stuff. But um yeah, this, I think that there's a lot of regulation that goes into these things. And it's yeah. not perfect, but uh, they haven't had any problems that are particularly public, let's say. Well, now, there's 25 seconds when yeah. you're actually it's about 22, the, yeah. 22. Does that feel long? It doesn't sound long. You know what? Uh, I think that for me, it never felt long enough. But for other people, it definitely felt longer. Okay. Uh, there's a sort of moment if I, I was always trying to do something right and, and so i was always running out of time but then there was a couple of times like early on when it was just like floating around and doing stuff that's that's felt like forever it's like how many one-arm push-ups can i do in this time like no yeah. problem <laughs> the amount of time is based upon what you do with it really and right i was distracting myself a whole lot with things that i probably shouldn't have been believe it or not mundao has already sent someone to space and next month they'll be sending two of us including myself on a zero g flight so how are they able to pull this off we're at dao so we basically open it up to the community to have anyone propose like projects to us so um, even though like our first thing was sending someone to space, the mission of the organization is to accelerate a lunar settlement. And so we, and the way that we're doing that is through bottoms up governance. So we allow anyone from the community to propose projects and we, we have this treasury that is owned by all of the token holders and they can use it towards whatever sort of initiatives that they want to do. Basically, uh, we at, at the Blue Origin launch, we got connected with um, another organization called Space for a Better World that does these zero gravity flights with, uh, with NASA astronauts like, uh, like Charlie Duke. And um, we, we spoke to her and then we, like uh, a few of the members of the organization were really excited about, you know, hey, what if we like sent someone, like sent people in our community to zero gravity and um, yeah, it was like, it was another one of those kind of like surreal things that you're like, you know, okay, we're going to charter a zero gravity flight and like send a bunch of people out of it. Like I'd never done anything like that before, but um, the community wanted to do that and then vote, uh, you know, to have some people join us in zero gravity. And then we also did a sweepstakes for that as well. And Pablo says the zero G flight that I will be on took almost nine months of planning. A lot of the DAO is really, it's sometimes hard to explain because like people come to us with all of these ideas from all over the world. They're like, hey, I want to do this. And it's just like pitching. So you pitch it to the community and then the community can fund it and do it. And so that's how Zero-G started. Someone pitched it to the community 
And they're like, yeah, let's do it. So if you wanna join me on my zero G flight, the deadline is February 7th. Thank you so much for watching this video. And of course, thank you to Moondow for giving me this amazing opportunity. I can't believe it's finally here and I'm really excited.